Okay, I think we can start. Um, actually, this is also live streaming on the YouTube. So there will also be some people who is watching from there, um, but only the people who is uh, streaming from the Zoom can ask questions and interact with Adam. Um, so to start with, um, welcome everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Yan and um, I'll be the host tonight. And uh, um, so uh, if you don't know, if it's your first time to participate in our events, um, um, this event is hosted by Seattle Entrepreneurship Club. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization um, that has been um, 12 years old and has been pretty active in Seattle area um, for the local entrepreneurship communities. Um, we organize all kinds of events um, and um, every Friday we have uh, this kind of talk um, just to help people um, gain new, new knowledges and also um, um, help with the communication um, for our community. And um, um, as I said, we have all kinds of events, weekly talk, um, and other than that, we also have monthly panel discussion around uh, specific topics. Um, we also have um, semi-annual startup competition, wines for um, the adult uh, startup organizations, and other is for the teenagers. Um, they can also have a great startup ideas and we also have a great prize for that. Um, other than we also host mentorship program. Uh, we have uh, VCs, we have um, all kinds of investors, companies, they, they'll probably um, have the program to help with the startups. And uh, we have our WeChat account that you can follow us. And we also have our newsletter. That's the best way that you can receive um, our most updated events uh, through the email. And um, we also have the email address if you want to contact us for any corporations or for any questions. And um, um, that's it today. Um, we are very happy to have Adam as our guest uh, who has been working on um, uh, the intellectual property for uh, over 25 years. And he's going to share his story and experience with us. And welcome, Adam. Thank you. Um, should I switch to share my screen? Uh, yeah. There we go. All right. So VIPs, very important patents. So we're going to go over a couple things today. And um, some of these are things that just, just came up to me this week that I thought would be useful. So our agenda today is going to be around patent misinformation, getting people on the same patent page so you understand what we're really talking about, new patent tools that are available, some perspectives on using intellectual property, and that thing we missed. So I was listening to a seminar that was put on by a very prominent venture capitalist. I won't name him because that, that wouldn't be fair since he doesn't have a chance to rebut this, but he talked about three kinds of intellectual property and only three kinds of intellectual property. He talks about patent, copyright, and trade secret. And I was like, wait a second, isn't there something missing? And then he went on to share some information about intellectual property in a cutting edge online format that was really out of date. And that made me think, wait a second, as a professional in this space, maybe we're not doing our job about keeping people up to date on what types of intellectual property is out there, how we are now using it, and what it can do for you. So um, a couple other myths that I came up with. In fact, I had to add the last one 
um, on a call that happened this evening, right as I was preparing the slides uh, for presentation today. Um, that one was, I'm okay, I have an invention promotion company helping me, um, which was clearly not the case of this particular potential client. But I've also heard that copyrights are just as good as patents. In some situations they might be, but people confuse them as interchangeable and because copyrights are a lot cheaper to get, that they think that they'll be just as effective. One of my favorite ones is I'll just keep it as a trade secret. And I'm gonna come back to this in a little bit later. Um, we, every couple months, I will get somebody asking me the question or telling me that they put it in an envelope, sealed it and mailed it to themselves and they kept the envelope closed. Isn't that good enough? Um, and then another perennial one is that patents are extremely slow and will take years to get. Now there are ways that it still takes years to get a patent, but we're gonna talk about some new ways. So anyone who has come to our office as a client understands the, or has heard me give the Frisbee talk because there's so much assumption of knowledge around patents that people end up thinking about patents in the wrong way. So we're gonna learn how to think about patents correctly using Frisbees. So um, I, don't, I can't get my normal reaction from the audience. And I would normally ask, where does the name Frisbee come from? Well, it comes from the Frisbee Pie Company because students at Yale would have picnics, eat the pies, and then when they were done, they would take the pie tins and they would throw them around. But since they'd been trained on golf courses to be polite, and you always warn people if you're gonna hit the golf ball downrange and somebody's there, they would yell Frisbee instead of yelling four to warn people that there is a spinning metal disc coming down the quad. Well, this was the old technology. This is what we call prior art. So the metal pie tin or the toy that was around at that time called the Pluto platter, those are the old technologies. Those are the unpatented technologies. Those are the things that were freely available. Okay, I was just checking the, the chat. So please, please feel free to leave questions uh, in the Q&A panel, and I will answer questions later. Um, but we have our prior art, the Pluto platter, but this company, Whammo, that was making the Pluto platter heard about these students that were having so much fun playing Frisbee. So they took the name, and because they weren't making pies, there wasn't any confusion. They took the name and applied it to their Pluto platter toy. And so we see this crossover piece where we have the Pluto platter and the name Frisbee on the same device, on this orange disc. But then somebody at Whammo came up with an improvement. They figured out a radical new innovation on the Frisbee, as they were starting to call that. And this is the Frisbee patent. In 1965, they did something here that gave them the right to ask for and receive a patent from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And most people looking at this Frisbee in the patent drawings and this Pluto platter think they look pretty similar. But Whammo added one element, one new improvement over the design. And if you look closely in figure one, there's a number 22. 
and it has three little arrows pointed to some ridges on the top of the frisbee. Those ridges are what we call laminar flow rings. Air hits those ridges, it goes turbulent, creates a low pressure zone on top of the frisbee, and that frisbee flies straighter and flies longer. And if you look at the text on the left, this is what we call a patent claim. This is the intellectual property boundary lines that you get when you file for a patent. Down in the last paragraph in that patent claim, it talks about an airflow spoiling means. That's those laminar flow rings. Airflow spoiling means means that it's a way of causing air to spoil or go turbulent. The addition of that one element was enough to move the unpatentable Pluto platter into the realm of the patentable Frisbee. And, the, and to this day, you still see the same model Frisbee, essentially unchanged, still with the laminar flow rings on it for sale. Now, patents don't give you the right to be in the marketplace. They give you a negative right, the right to exclude people from the marketplace. So interestingly, a few years later, there's another company, not Whammo, who came out with a very similar toy. And you will notice in figure one, they still have the ridges, those laminar flow rings. You can see it as number 104 in the drawings. And so people in the know are going to be wondering, hey, wait a second, didn't Whammo have the patent rights? And couldn't they exclude people from the marketplace? Well, let's look at how you exclude people from the marketplace. The claim elements are key. So if we have claim elements A, B, and C, so it's round, plastic, descending sidewalls, has laminar flow rings. Those are our four elements. And we find a product with those four elements. Let's go back and look. Flashlight is round, has descending sidewalls, made out of plastic, has the laminar flow rings. We would think that that would be an infringing product. One important difference though, Flashlight came around in 2003. Patents are only for a limited period of time. And the Frisbee patent issued in 1967. So that means back then the law was you got 17 years from when your patent issued. The law has changed now, it's now 20 years from when you file. But back then, our key date was 1967. That meant that in 1984, their patent expired. And when a patent expires, that negative right goes away. Now you can no longer stop anyone. It's called going into the public domain. So there's now no longer a right to keep people from using that. Now, so Flashlight can keep on making their flash flight throwing toy. But wait, what's so special about it? It looks really similar. Again, if you look down at the bottom of the claim elements, in their claim, they have an electronics assembly with fiber optic fibers that bring light to the edge of the throwing disc. Again, adding a new useful non-obvious combination together was enough for Flashlight to get their patent. So if we look at this again with claim elements, even though Flashlight has elements A, B, C, and D, there wouldn't be infringement because the earlier Whammo patent for the Frisbee had expired. Now, again, adding new elements. So with Flashlight adding one more element in their fiber optic lighting assembly, 
doesn't get them away from being of uh, being infringing if the patent if the frisbee patent was still in force it's only when you go back and remove elements or change elements that you can avoid infringement such as if we went back to the old pluto platter because that was in the prior art that was unpatentable known technology and Whammo couldn't go back and recapture that because it wasn't new anymore. So I wanted to level set us so we're all thinking about patents in the same way, that it's patents have claims, they have elements, and the way we use them is we match up elements to products out there and see if that product is infringing on a patent that's still in force. So now that we can get this negative right, what can we do with it? Why get a patent? Marketing. Patents tend to be good for public relations for companies. There's, there's a stamp of legitimacy on a product, particularly in the US, if a consumer hears that this is using patented technology. It can be useful as a defensive tool. It lets other companies know that you had been working on this technology at a provable point in time, and it puts them on notice that they shouldn't threaten you if you were ahead of them. A more sophisticated way of using intellectual property is patents are a special kind of tool that can be a force multiplier. So a small company with a strong patent can get the attention of a much larger company to get access to that larger company's own IP. Because if the large company is either threatened or wants access to the patented technology from the smaller company, the patent can be a lever that will move an otherwise much larger adversary or potential partner. Likewise, you can use your patent like you would any other piece of property, just like your car or your house. You can give permission to other people to use it in exchange for something of value, usually money. And so when people talk about licensing their IP, they're letting other people use it and promising that they won't sue that person for using it if they keep to the terms of their license. Now. Sometimes people don't want a license and they want to use it offensively to keep competitors out of the marketplace. So you can sue for money or damages, or you can sue for injunctions, getting a court to tell somebody to stop doing something. Interestingly, suing for money in the US tends to be much easier, but in other places it's different. Also, from an investment dis perspective, despite one VC not having the nicest things to say about patents, many companies value the use of patents as a barrier of entry tool that keeps competitors from getting into the same marketplace and boosts the value of the company that owns the patent. And so patents are seen as company assets and can boost the valuations or the perceived value of a company and any combination of the above. But I want to get to a reason that's not listed here that is of particular significance for entrepreneurs and particularly entrepreneurs that are talking with investors because investors almost never sign non-disclosure agreements. There are lots of reasons I've heard for that, but for your most successful investors, they're looking at deal flow for their investments. And ideally they're looking at a lot of deal flow, which means seeing a lot of ideas. The overhead cost of managing separate non-disclosure agreements, each one would be a separate contract that would have to be negotiated and then tracked and followed and monitored the overhead of that is just unmanageable for most investors. And so they will 
just as a way of keeping themselves sane and managing their legal bills, they never want to sign them because signing up for an NDA is just begging to be sued in the future in the eyes of many investors. Now, for those potential investees who have interesting inventions that they're keeping secret, if somebody doesn't sign an NDA, you can destroy your trade secret if you're forced to reveal that to somebody else outside of some confidentiality agreement. So usually you'll have confidentiality with other people within your company and you'll have confidentiality with people that you sign NDAs with or you'll have confidentiality with your attorney because we have attorney client privilege which is better than any NDA. But if you're talking to investors that have no obligation now to keep your technology secret, you could have just destroyed one of the crown jewels of your company unless you've taken some step to protect it, such as patents. But don't patents take too long to get? Well, it used to be. Um, back when I started and I was working at the world's largest law firm, it was normal to see a patent take half a year for an attorney to draft. And they would take five or more years to go through examination at the patent office. That was considered normal. Most of us know that most entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and startup companies, five years, I mean, that's multiple funding rounds and probably an exit. Um, or if not, probably an exit, at least a high possibility of an exit. So, won't the patents be irrelevant by then? Ah, well, recently the US has come up with a new system. And in fact, we use this with one of our clients called Dragon Chain. That's Dragon Chain's very cute logo. It took one month to draft the patent application. The patent office examined it and allowed the patent in two months. And our client had a patent in three and a half months. Now, for those of you who aren't used to the US patent system, um, that isn't as shocking to us patent attorneys as it was at the time, but we were absolutely floored. And then we went on to repeat it multiple times of getting patents in less than half a year. Um, in normal range nowadays, using the new track one filing system, which still gives you the same kind of patent that still lasts for 20 years, is it usually has an examination range of four to 10 months. And this has been dramatically changing how people think about IP protection, particularly patent protection with startup companies. Because once you actually have an enforceable tool that can keep people out of the marketplace, with the right kind of investment, that can be a very interesting and powerful tool. Now, we work with startup companies. We also work with large, sophisticated companies that have complex patent portfolios. So I'm going to tell you about one more complex scenario. So remember, patents are assets. And I'm going to tell you a real story. Happens to be about a local company, Real Networks. So they were, Real Networks was a groundbreaking company in the field of streaming media. They basically invented the foundational patents around streaming media, both audio and then video in the early, early 90s. And they built up this patent portfolio that we were managing for them um, through the later part of this period. And then in 2011, Real Networks changed their business strategy. And 
they looked around and they said, you know what, these patents that we have no longer relate to the business that we are going forward with. So what do we do with them? So they remembered patents are assets and they listed their patent portfolio for sale. That patent portfolio was purchased by Intel for $120 million. That was about $1 million per patent. Real Networks got a 40X return on their legal fee investment. But Intel also remembered that patents are assets. And so Intel added 800 more patents to the portfolio that they had gathered either from their own inventors or from other sources, spending about another $16 million doing that. And in 2019, they sold the portfolio to Apple for $1 billion. Total profit, $864 million to Intel. And they got a 6x return. Again, the interesting thing about patents is that for small companies and for large companies, they can be very strategic assets. The reason why this portfolio that went from real networks to Intel and then to Apple was so important is it had some of the most foundational inventions relating to mobile communications. And in particular, sending complex data between network devices, and in particular, cell phones. Now, what do you get by enforcing patents? And then, you know, the, I answered my question right there with my favorite lawyer response, it depends. So patents give you the right to stop anyone from making a patented product which makes us think, where was this made? Where was it manufactured? Using a patented product or practicing a patented process. So where is the product or process being used? Offering it for sale. So you can stop somebody from offering your invention for sale. Where are sales events taking place? Online, conferences, different countries, and then where is it being sold? Again, can be another location. And then importing. So if you have a patent in the US, even if you don't have a patent in another country, you can stop that, invent that patented product from entering the US at the border. Other countries have a similar set of patent rights that go along with a patent in those countries. So when you're enforcing your patent, your patent rights in the US, you can usually, if you're in the right and somebody is infringing, get usually 100% of your lost profits or 100% of the reasonable royalties of what that person should have paid you if they had licensed the product from you. For historical reasons and many reasons, US courts are very reluctant to issue injunctions on patents. Maybe only 10% of the cases where somebody asks for the court to order the losing side to do something, will the court actually go ahead and do that? In the US, it's generally viewed that look, if you can be paid back all the money you lost, then that should be good enough. And in the US, if the infringer is a willful infringer, the courts can sometimes triple dam those damages. So you can get 300% of your lost profits or 500% of your reasonable royalties. Now, getting high damages in one case will often be convincing to other potential defendants to take a high licensing value or to, to pay 
high licensing fees to license that product because they don't want to be sued and get hit for a potential willful uh, infringement. Now, since this is the SEC and we talk about how business relationships between the US and China um, can be encouraged and take place, one of the interesting things is to look at the Chinese court system as it relates to patents. So when I went to Shanghai for the first time over a dozen years ago, I was meeting with the head of a local patent firm. And he said, Adam, things are so much better now. I was like, Li Ju, why are they so much better? He's like, now 40% of the judges have college degrees. And unfortunately, that's what most US law firms still think is going on in the court system as it relates to patents in China. And they could not be more wrong because in the past five years, China has completely revamped their patent court system. And the IP courts that have been set up now have extremely experienced patent judges. The courts have been raised so that every patent litigation has a chance to go to the Supreme People's Court. And just in the past month or two, they've raised the uh, willfulness level to even higher than the US of quintuple damages. So you can, if you have a willful infringer of a patent, you can get five times as much of the damages. Unfortunately, for people suing for money damages in China, courts there are very reluctant to give out the full 100% value of lost profits or reasonable royalties. And there are, there are a number of reasons for that. The courts just aren't used to issuing those, those high damage awards. And many of the Chinese patent attorneys who are arguing and litigating in the courts aren't used to providing the level of proof that's needed. I was, this came up in conversation last year when I was talking with one of the patent judges in China. She, she was telling me she wanted to issue higher damages, but the lawyers weren't presenting enough proof. But the level of experience in the judges from a legal perspective and the, the technical experts that they now have at these IP courts is better than what we have in the US at the initial litigation level. The shining, the bright spot in the Chinese litigation uh, sky is the possibility of injunctions. Chinese courts are much more willing to issue injunctions. And so oftentimes international companies that have patents both in the US and patents in China will start thinking in a very strategic way about where it makes sense to sue their competitors. Because if you can get a court in China to issue an injunction that says your competitor cannot manufacture anywhere in China, that might be more valuable than getting reasonable royalties back in the United States. That could be an even greater damage amount and a better bargaining position to be in. And so it's, and it's, now it's no longer just manufacturing, which historically China was known for, but it's also selling because the Chinese marketplace is, has become such a huge marketplace for new technologies and new products and processes that are patented, but not always patented in China, often to the chagrin of clients in the US because their IP attorneys didn't realize how much things have changed in China. And in fact, many of these IP courts are treating foreign litigators or foreign plaintiffs um, as good or better than uh, Chinese companies because they have more experience and handle the litigations 
more professionally. And they've been winning. Um, the Beijing IP court um, had a substantial uh, win ratio for out-of-state uh, litigants. So is it better to sue in the US or China? It depends. Now, we talked about what did we forget? And the image is the clue. Many clients come to us with their bright ideas, but we have to remind them that protecting the goodwill in their companies and their reputation is also important. And we do that with the one type of intellectual property that was left off in that online lecture that I was talking about. We're talking, of course, about trademarks. A trademark is a word, phrase, logo, or other identifier. So the name Nike or the swoosh on the side or the, the slogan, just do it. All of those trademarks that we instantly associate with this provider of goods and services. In the US, you have to be using a trademark to get it. In other countries, it's simply enough to get it registered with the trademark office of that country. I once worked uh, in a firm that had a very interesting case where they had a brand that was sold only in America, was listed as made in America, and so they thought they didn't need any international trademark protection. But they took advantage of NAFTA's manufacturing rules and manufactured their fashion brand, their fashion products in a maquiladora, which was located in Mexico. And some bright trademark pirate filed for trademark protection in Mexico and then went to the maquiladora and says, I am seizing all of these counterfeit goods because you don't have a trademark in Mexico and I do, and therefore all of these products are counterfeit. So that was a very painful negotiation for that client because they didn't think that they were operating outside of the US because they had the label made in the USA. But made in the USA isn't always exactly what is meant from a trademark perspective. So trademarks protect you against others using a confusingly similar mark for similar goods or services. And the reason why I hammer this home in this talk and I do with all of my clients when they first come to us is because we actually see more conflicts around trademarks than we see about patents, trade secrets, or copyrights combined. Because in this age where domain names and websites and just the hashtags, the source identifiers that people are using to find your goods or services have become so tied to your presence online that there are going to be other people with similar trademarks out there that are going to start getting confused for yours and vice versa. And we always tell our clients at the, once you start investing in marketing dollars or um, any type of uh, brand enhancement, that's the time when you really need to start considering trademark protection as soon as possible in the US because why spend all that money only to find out that somebody else has beat you to it beforehand? So with that, um, since I've covered even the forgotten form of intellectual property, um, I will open the floor for our questions. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for sharing. So, if anyone has any question, feel free to post in the Q&A session. And we got one question here from Aaron. Great presentation, Adam. 
while Macau, Hong Kong, and Taiwan are all part of one China's special administrative regions. At one time, each SAR has their own IP registration system agency, and the company was advised to register their IP with each of the four respective agencies, three SARs and PRC, so many terms. <laughs> <laughs> whether or not they plan on doing business in the SAR. Is this true for today? Should a company register their IP in Taiwan? For example, even if they plan to manufacture or sell in mainland China only. So, you of course know my answer, which is it depends. But what does it depend on? So if we go back and if we look, why do we, why do we get patents? So if I can go all the way back. So I would look at, I would look at the things that you would want to use a patent for. And so let's say, um, it was a patent relating to a form of uh, gambling technology that's only legally allowed in Macau. It's illegal in China and it's illegal in Hong Kong and it's illegal in Taiwan. Maybe patent protection for that is only good if it's in Macau if all we care about is use, stopping people from using. But if there are Chinese companies that are manufacturing the technology that is then supplied to Macau, okay, now we're talking about making and using. But if uh, gambling conferences where people are showcasing the technology for sale are happening in Taipei, then we need to look at all the different rights that might come into play and where they might be happening. But if we, but if we know that the product is never going to be manufactured, sold, imported into, um, or used or offered for sale in a jurisdiction, then there's no, no great point in having that uh, protection in that country, unless having that patent would be important to another co uh, uh, company in that country. And then it's a licensing opportunity. So we'd go back to this monetization as a reason to get a patent. Um, or um, we, there may be some question as to if the laws are going to change in the future. So right now it could be illegal um, in China or, or illegal in Taiwan, but in the future that might change. So for example, um, I had a client that was in the remittance technology business. So they use remittances to, um, um, to send money to people in other countries. And one country that uses a lot of remittances is North Korea. So we actually got a patent in North Korea, even though the client wasn't using it because they thought in the future, there might be some value. Eventually they decided to abandon it, but there was that leaving their options open in the future. Um, so there's a question from Nick Gare to the panelists and attendees. Yes, Nick seems disagree with. Do he you, wants to speak, I don't know. Do you mind let him speak? Um, I would, I'm not so sure. Come, 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 come. Um, okay, 
Probably okay. you got you get you guys can bring this offline. Yeah, so never mind. Um, so the there was another question. How should a startup build patent portfolios with a limited budget? I'm a big fan of using tools like uh, provisional patent applications, which buy, get you an early uh, filing date for your patent protection, and it preserves both your US and your international rights because it is a full, uh, it, it's a real patent, you're, you're patent pending, but it doesn't, last the full length of a patent. It only lasts for one year, and then you would need to file a regular patent application in order to get the, uh, the full protection. But they're a less formal document. You're not required to actually craft the patent claims in order to get the protection of a provisional patent application. It's just to provide proof that you've come up with something. So where the full cost of a non-provisional, um, I'll use our firm as an example, price averages around $30,000 for the government fees and the uh, attorney fees. The cost of filing um, a provisional is under $8,000. And in fact, when we work with our clients, we actually give them a credit because we can reuse some of the um, additional, uh, we can use some of the information that we first uh, put in the provisional patent application. The one thing that we've had to recommend our clients not do to save money, unless they have somebody on their team that has experience, is to write their own patent applications because we've had to fix too many mistakes in the past. So we actually came up with a new uh, way of working with those clients. And that's using what we call a coached provisional. Because if you don't have experience, you can write the wrong kind of document. And we then will instead come along for the ride with the client. They'll do the writing and they'll do the drawings, but we'll make sure that they, have, that they stay on point and um, don't lose course from protecting the invention that they initially described to us at the beginning of the process. Um, and that is under $4,000 for us to work with a client to document their invention. But the reason, getting back to the point of doing this on a limited budget, a year is a long time to get revenue and or investment. And so you start by preserving your IP with a provisional patent application and then work, focus on your business to get investment and or revenue for your company, and then use somebody else's money to draft the more expensive parts of the full, the full patents in your uh, patent portfolio. So that's one of our more tried and true methods for working with startups on a limited budget. Okay, thank you for your answer, Adam. Okay. Um, so, Quang Quang, how to choose which country to start filing patents between US and China, considering the potential export control from one country to another country? So, both China and the US have specific rules on where you have to file first to avoid export issues. Um, if you have Chinese inventors in China, you have to file in China first. Otherwise, it's a violation of China's export rules. As soon as you file in China, it'll be examined to see if you are permitted to have a foreign filing license. Once you get a notification that your foreign filing license has been granted, you can file in the US as well. Likewise, the US has the same kind of rules that you're supposed to file in the US first. And then um, you will receive 
what we'd call a filing receipt, and there'll be a little note, foreign filing granted. So the vast majority of uh, patents, both in China and in the US, it's very routine to have the foreign filing license granted. Um, there are complex situations where sometimes you're working with joint development teams where there's, it looks like the export rules are in conflict with each other. And there are ways of getting around that as well, um, including filing what's known as an international patent application, but choosing English language and filing it in China first. Um, okay. Um, so if you think that there is going to be an export control issue on your patent, um, talk to your patent attorney and they'll give you, it, it starts getting complex, particularly when you have teams with multiple uh, jurisdictions. India is also another one that has very strict rules around uh, exports. And so we've seen Indian, Chinese, and US uh, joint development groups. And in those situations, sometimes you'll need to separate out the process of applying for an export license before you file anywhere. And it's good to do that ahead of time. Um, question from Aaron Rose. Can you give a brief explanation of first to file versus first to use and which jurisdiction companies should be particularly aware of regarding each system? So the, the US, until a few years ago, used to be a first to invent country. Whichever inventor first invented the application, invented the invention, was the one who was entitled to patent protection. And because of that, you would see inventors keeping meticulous notes in invention notebooks as they came up with ideas, dating them, having those witnessed, because it became very important to prove who had invented something first. Most of the rest of the world went via a first to file system. So much like the first to register trademark system um, and um, in the trademark realm where, versus the first to use a trademark in the US. I guess Aaron might actually be asking about trademarks. Let me finish on, on patents and then I'll switch over to trademarks and, and how they relate. So with the, U, the US is now harmonized with the rest of the world mostly. We're not a pure first to file country. We're the first inventor to file. So if somebody else hears about an invention from the inventor and they run off to the patent office to file it, they're not entitled to that because they heard about it from someone else. Now that's important because the US gives you a one year grace period so you can talk about your invention even before you file for your patent application. And if you were the first one to invent it, if you, if you were the invent, one of the inventors of it and you file and you're the first one to file, you're entitled to that. Other countries don't allow a grace period. So they require absolute novelty. If the inventor invents it, they need to keep it secret and file their patent application without telling anybody because as soon as they tell somebody, it's like a trade secret, it destroys the patent rights as well. Now, um, Aaron was probably talking about first to file for verse to use trademarks. There is, so it's, we want first to register, not necessarily, uh, and it will, and it sometimes relates to first to file anywhere in the world. Whoever has the first filing date somewhere in the world that's going to count, what we call a priority date. Because, so as an example, we had a client in the US filed for a trademark 
and was also interested in going to Australia. And so six months later, we filed another application in Australia that claimed the benefit of the US trademarks date. In the meantime, after our client had come up with this new brand in the US, an Australian company came up with a very similar brand. And because everything was happening in Australia, it, it happened quite quickly. They got a registered trademark in Australia for this brand. When our client came into Australia, their mark eventually registered. And because the first priority date predated that Australian company, that Australian company actually had their trademark revoked. In the US, whoever is first using a trademark is considered the senior holder. So even if somebody else files for a trademark and they're the first one to file, if a US holder a US, US user of a trademark can prove that they've been using it continuously and kept that brand alive earlier than the first use date that that, let, that, that first filer has, a court will often allow the first user to get that mark back and register it as the senior rights holder. In other countries, it gets much more complex. And so if you ever want a wonderful balancing act and history of how it's applied in China, look at Michael Jordan's uh, trademark disputes with the shoe company that uses a very similar logo to his Jumping Man logo. And that's a very interesting history, both about the history of what it looks like in a first to register, first to file country like China versus a first to use country. China has, has changed their trademark law somewhat to make it clear that you can't register for a trademark in bad faith. So you can't see somebody else's brand and say, ha ha, they're famous. I'm going to take that brand and register it in China before they think about doing it. So I'm going to take their goodwill away from them. A trademark is like a bucket that holds your reputation. And courts are now looking at people and seeing if they were trying to steal somebody's bucket of reputation in another country. And they're generally finding some way to not allow that. Um, the, but it's expensive and difficult to go through and improve, improve that process. Hopefully I did that justice, Aaron. Um, ah. So Gary asks, where should an early startup spend money? Patent, product versus patent. It depends. Um, and, and the usual way that I get past it depends is I get three, three different people in the room to discuss the company's priorities. One person from the patent and legal side, one person from the business side, and then one person from the technology side. If all three people agree that, the, that it's patentable, that it's of strong business importance to the company, and that the technology is uncommon and very effective, then I'd lean towards getting the patent as a core part of the process. But f if you're short on money, find the most efficient way of preserving that early protection. If on the other hand, any one of those three things is weak, even if it's, even if it's very important to the business 
and technologically very interesting, some kinds of things are not patentable. Or it could be very patentable and very technologically interesting, but from a business perspective, it's not particularly valuable. It doesn't add to the business uh, efficacy for that company. Or similarly, it could be patentable, great for the business, but there are 20 other technological alternatives that are out there that could be substituted that wouldn't be patent infringing. So it's, it's, it's worth having that discussion to then make an intelligent business decision of where to spend limited money, particularly limited founder money at the early startup stage. Which is, I mean, that was the reason why we came up and basically uh, pioneered this coached provisional process because a good technologist can describe their technology and illustrate it and document that they've created something. But if they don't know what they're supposed to be documenting or how they're supposed to be doing it, it can be a waste of their time and energy. But by having a patent attorney come along for the ride and navigate with them and keep them on course, they can produce a document that will actually help preserve the assets of the company. All right. I don't see any more questions. We have another question in the chat. I'm not sure if we have answered this. Which from, one? From Maggie. He asked, could you please introduce briefly how an unregistered trademark is protected in US? Briefly? No, I can't. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so an unregistered trademark is what's considered, it's called a common law trademark. It's the, the fact that you've been using a mark in the US, there are some rights that have been accumulated around that. It's going to vary depending on your state and in the courts that you're enforcing it. Um, but basically, you'll go to the courts and you'll provide proof of your earlier use. And so the scenario I'm imagining is if somebody is infringing your trademark and you have an unregistered trademark and that there isn't any other federal registration involved. Um, if the, um, at that point, the court is going to look at how much rights you have accumulated. And it's gonna really depend on what your business activities have looked like. If on the one hand, you've had years of uh, multi-state business transactions under a given brand, a court may give that a lot of weight. But if you're a relatively new company, relatively unknown, and you've only been operating in a local jurisdiction, the court might say that your reputation and your common law rights haven't been, become strong enough to enforce them outside of your locality. So maybe a Seattle company uh, might get their common law rights protected, but not against a Portland company or a Miami, Florida company. So that's going to be a much more uh, variable on how a court, a court is gonna assess your reputation and see how that would, how that could be enforced. It's much cleaner um, if you qualify for federal trademark protection. And federal trademark protection is much less expensive than patents. I mean, usually we're looking at two to $3,000 for the whole process. So 10% of what it would cost uh, to get a patent and your brand, to many people, your brand is you. And so that can be one of the best places to invest uh, some of your sparse legal dollars early on uh, in, the in the startup company's process. So hopefully that was an adequate answer. There isn't a short, but the, the, 
the TLDR is, uh, there isn't a short answer for this one. Okay. If you have any more questions, you can definitely contact Adam offline sometimes. And oh, wait, uh, there was one last one. Do I need to do experiments to prove the results of my intention as part of my patent application? No. And in fact, there are patents for faster than light communication that have been issued by the patent office. Now, most people in the physics world would tell you there's no such thing as faster than light communication. The patent office's view is, okay, in that case, there will never be an infringer and there's no harm issuing the patents. But if this person actually did invent something that is faster than light communication, then they absolutely deserve a patent. So either amazing invention, they deserve it, or there was no harm in giving this person a patent since nobody would infringe it. So you don't need to prove the results. You just need to be able to describe it in sufficient detail that someone sees that you have the invention. All right, sorry for interrupting. No problem. Oh, got another one. How early should a startup company to get trademark protection? Rule of thumb is once you start dedicating $5,000 or more towards your marketing, it's a good time to see if you can afford trademark protection. Because if you're spending that much money on boosting your reputation, you really want to make sure that you're not going to be wasting that money. And so it, it's a great way to reduce your risks early on. And particularly if you're going to be looking at nationwide or international protection, getting it uh, filed early can be extremely beneficial because I've seen uh, multiple people start using the same marks very, very close in time with each other. And um, it's the ones that you know, filed for that protection, made sure that they were using it, that were the ones that were able to keep using it into the future. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah, no more questions. All right. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing your expertise and experience. So if anyone else have any more questions, feel free to contact Adam offline. And I should probably